Almost a decade ago, I was recognized as being one of the top 40 business school professors under 40. It's an annual award where you're nominated by students, then vetted by the organization giving the award, and ta-da, the list appears. I was so touched and honored to be recognized alongside colleagues I respected and admired. It felt really good. It was in my early years of being a professor, so this accolade made it feel like all the hard work had paid off. But then I got a call from my school's PR saying that I had been removed from the list. At the time, students could post comments on the recognition site, and a couple of students posted some, let's say, not so flattering things about me. And the organization decided I no longer deserved the recognition. I was livid. I mean, utterly upset, heartbroken, and to this day, the thought of it brings tears to my eyes. And I'm telling you about this experience to point out how powerful negativity online can be, even when it may just be a couple of angry people saying unverified things. And I am by no means a perfect professor, but I think it's messed up that for people who have some type of public profile, just doing our jobs makes us vulnerable to online trolls, naysayers, critics, whatever you want to call them. But what are you supposed to do when this happens to you? I couldn't write something nasty back without seeming totally unprofessional. And yes, my university and I fought it, but ultimately we lost the battle. Well, today's speaker talks about one very unique response we could have to online critics that I think we can all learn from. This is Ted Business, and I'm Madhupa Akinola. Today, we're going to hear from Dylan Marin, who made a name for himself posting videos online that satirize social injustices. His work stirred up a lot of online hate. In fact, he now hosts a podcast called Conversations with People Who Hate Me. He's working on a book right now about fostering radical empathy on the internet and having difficult conversations with people who say hurtful things. After the talk, I'll share additional thoughts on how to deal with hurtful comments. But first, a quick break. I've received hate online, a lot of it, and it comes with the territory of my work. I'm a digital creator. I make things specifically for the internet. Like a few years ago, I made a video series called Every Single Word, where I edited down popular films to only the words spoken by people of color as a way to empirically and accessibly talk about the issue of representation in Hollywood. Then, later, as transphobic bathroom bills started gaining media attention around the United States, I hosted and produced an interview series called Sitting in Bathrooms with Trans People, where I did exactly that. And then, are you familiar with those unboxing videos on YouTube where YouTubers open up the latest electronic gadgets? Great, so I satirized those in a weekly series where instead I unboxed intangible ideologies like police brutality, masculinity, and the mistreatment of Native Americans. Um, My work... Thanks. (laughs) One person applauding. God bless. Um, (laughs) Mom, hi. Um, So my work became very popular. I got millions of views, a ton of great press, and a slew of new followers. But the flip side of success on the internet is internet hate. I was called everything, from beta to snowflake, and of course, the ever-popular cuck. Don't worry, I will break these terms down for you. (laughs) Um, So beta, for those of you unfamiliar, is shorthand online lingo for beta male. But let's be real, I wear pearl earrings and my fashion aesthetic is rich white woman running errands, so I'm not angling to be an alpha. (laughs) Doesn't totally work. Um, (laughs) Now, Snowflake is a put-down for people who are sensitive and believe themselves to be unique, and I'm a millennial and an only child, so duh. (laughs) But my favorite, favorite, favorite is cuck. 
It's a slur, short for cuckold, for men who have been cheated on by their wives. But friends, I am so gay that if I had a wife, I would encourage her to cheat on me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of this negativity in action. Um, sometimes it's direct, like Marcos, who wrote, you're everything I hate in a human being. Thank you, Marcos. Others write to me with questions, like Brian, who asked, were you born a bitch or did you just learn to be one over time? But my favorite thing about this is that once Brian was done typing, his finger must have slipped because then he sent me <laughs> the thumbs up emoji. <laughs> so babe, thumbs up to you too. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's fun to talk about these messages now, right? And it's cathartic to laugh at them. But I can tell you that it really does not feel good to receive them. Uh, at first, I would screenshot their comments and make fun of their typos, but this soon felt elitist and ultimately unhelpful. So over time, I developed an unexpected coping mechanism. Because most of these messages I received were through social media, I could often click on the profile picture of the person who sent them and learn everything about them. I could see pictures they were tagged in, posts they'd written, memes they'd shared, and somehow seeing that it was a human on the other side of the screen made me feel a little better. Not to justify what they wrote, right? But just to provide context. Still, that didn't feel like enough. So, I called some of them, only the ones I felt safe talking to, with a simple opening question. Why did you write that? The first person I spoke to was Josh. He had written to tell me that I was a moron, I was a reason this country was dividing itself, and he added at the end that being gay was a sin. I was so nervous for our first conversation. This wasn't a comment section, so I couldn't use tools like muting or blocking. Of course, I guess, um, I could have hung up on him, but I didn't want to because I liked talking to him, because I liked him. Here's a clip of one of our conversations. Josh, you said that you're about to graduate high school, right? Mm -hmm. How is high school for you? Am I allowed to use the H-E double hockey stick word? Oh, yeah, you're allowed to. It was hell. <laughs> really? And it's still hell right now, even though it's only two weeks left. I'm a little bit bigger. I don't like to use the word fat, but I am a little bit bigger than a lot of my classmates, and they seem to judge me before they even got to know me. That's awful. I mean, I also just want to let you know, Josh, I was bullied in high school, too. So did our common ground of being bullied in high school erase what he wrote me? No. And did our single phone conversation radically heal a politically divided country and cure systemic injustice? No, absolutely not, right? But did our conversation humanize us to each other more than profile pictures and posts ever could? Absolutely. I didn't stop there because some of the hate I received was from my side. So when Matthew, a queer, liberal artist like me, publicly wrote that I represented some of the worst aspects of liberalism, I wanted to ask him this. You tagged me in this post. Did you want me to see it? I honestly didn't think that you would. Have you ever been publicly dragged? I have been, and I just said, I, I, no, I don't care. And did you not care? But it care? was hard. Did you not care? Um, oh, well, I cared, yes. At the end of these conversations, there's often a moment of reflection, a reconsideration, and that's exactly what happened at the end of my call with a guy named Doug, who had written that I was a talentless propaganda hack. Did the conversation we just had, does it, like, make you feel differently about how you write online? Yeah, you know, when I, when I said this to you, when I said you were a talentless hack, I had never conversed with you in my life, really. Yeah. I didn't really know anything really about you. And I think that a lot of times that's what the comment sections really are. It's mm -hmm. really a way to get your anger at the world out on random profiles of strangers, pretty much. Yeah, um, <laughs> right, right. But it definitely has made me rethink the way that I interact with people online. 
So I've collected these conversations and many others for my podcast, Conversations with People Who Hate Me. <laughs> Before I started this project, I thought that the real way to bring about change was to shut down opposing viewpoints through epically worded video essays and comments and posts, but I soon learned those were only cheered on by the people who already agreed with me. Sometimes the most subversive thing you could do was to actually speak with the people you disagreed with and not simply at them. Now, in every one of my calls, I always ask my guests to tell me about themselves, and it's their answer to this question that allows me to empathize with them. And empathy, it turns out, is a key ingredient in getting these conversations off the ground, but it can feel very vulnerable to be empathizing with someone you profoundly disagree with. So I established a helpful mantra for myself. Empathy is not endorsement. Empathizing with someone you profoundly disagree with does not suddenly compromise your own deeply held beliefs and endorse theirs. Empathizing with someone who, for example, believes that being gay is a sin doesn't mean that I'm suddenly going to drop everything, pack my bags, and grab my one-way ticket to hell, right? It just means that I'm acknowledging the humanity of someone who was raised to think very differently from me. I also want to be super clear about something. This is not a prescription for activism, right? I understand that some people don't feel safe talking to their detractors, and others feel so marginalized that they justifiably don't feel that they have any empathy to give. I totally get that. This is just what I feel well-suited to do. You know, I've reached out to a lot of people, and some have politely declined, others have read my message and ignored it, some have blocked me automatically when I sent the invitation, and one guy actually agreed to do it, and then five minutes into the call, hung up on me. I'm also aware that this talk will appear on the internet. And with the internet comes comment sections, and with comment sections, inevitably, comes hate. So as you are watching this talk, you can feel free to call me whatever you'd like, You can call me a snowflake, a cuck, a beta, or everything wrong with liberalism. But just know that if you do, I may ask you to talk. And if you refuse or block me automatically or agree and hang up on me, then maybe, babe, the snowflake is you. Thank you so much. You know what really stood out to me about this talk and connects with that 40 under 40 situation? The point one of Dylan's detractors brought up, and I quote, comment sections are a way to get your anger out at the world. He's saying, it's not personal. It wasn't about Dylan at all. It was just this person's way of blowing off steam, lashing out because he could. And this behavior isn't so different from the experience of many people at work. Remember that time when your boss blew up at you in a meeting and you looked around and wondered, is this about me? Well, sometimes it's not about you. Sometimes it's just about somebody directing their own frustrations at a person they think won't respond. And some bosses don't even get in trouble for being rude to their employees. Just like most online commenters never face any real-life consequences for anything they write. So one thing to remember when you're on the receiving end of some person's anger is that it's probably not really about you. And this doesn't mean you're powerless or that you should just brush off that sort of behavior. Maybe like Dylan, you can react with an invitation to have a conversation, which encourages the other person to see you as a real human, as someone who was harmed by their words. And if you're the person blowing off steam unnecessarily in meetings or trolling on websites writing nasty comments because you can, ask yourself, who is this really about? Is it about them or me? Is there a conversation I could have that would be more useful? And can I be courageous enough to initiate that conversation? That's it for today. This episode was produced by Maria Luisa Tucker, researched by Cassie Brabaugh, and fact-checked by Eliza Solomon. Our mixer is Sam Baer, and special thanks to Anna Phelan, Michelle Quint, Corey Hajim, and Colin Helms. I'm Madhupa Akinola. 
talk to you again next week. 